Hello, everybody, and welcome to the, today's webinar on the adolescent brain. My name is Mike Meeks, and I am the National Training Manager for Boys Town. I've been with Boys Town for 15 years. I've had experience teaching and being an administrator in various schools here on campus, from gen ed classrooms to um, more specialized environments, uh, hospitalized environments, and treatment reform schools. And I am very excited to be speaking to you today on this subject. So before we start, we want to talk to you a little bit about the title and make sure that you understand that we believe that teens are, for the most part, truly not insane. And we understand that insanity is no longer a medical diagnosis. Uh, we'll be using that term more tongue-in-cheek and using it as a, a term to describe adolescent behavior as sometimes so off the wall it could be considered insanity. But we hope we offer help in dealing with teen behavior that maybe you don't understand. At Boys Town, our mission is to change the way America cares for our children, families, and communities by providing and promoting an integrated continuum of care that instills Boys Town values to strengthen body, mind, and spirit. And at National Training, our part in that mission is to provide social-emotional behavior-based models, multi-tiered interventions, and research-supported methods that we utilize to train across the country hundreds of schools and thousands of educators. In addition, for Boys Town, part of our mission is to strengthen communities. For nearly 100 years, Boys Town has worked to strengthen communities as we support children and families seeking healing from past trauma, relational challenges, and mental health concerns. Boys Town provides a range of services to meet children and families where they are and to serve them in the greatest capacity possible. At National Training, we also work hard to empower schools to effectively deal with the ever-increasing challenges that present themselves each day. Our education model provides schools and programs with a safe, positive, and proactive approach to teaching pro-social behaviors. Uh, before we start, we need to talk a little bit about um, some misconceptions you may have about adolescents and also students. Whenever we first started teaching, um, we had some, just some preconceived ideas, I know I did, and likely many of you did out there whenever we started teaching that our students would be excited to learn, they would be, they would love their teacher, they would listen intently, they would meet all of our expectations, and they would always get along with their peers. So the reality is that students have normal behavior. They get angry, they cry, they argue, they get off task, they often have problems with their peers. This is normal and part of adolescent growth. So our goals for today in this webinar are to look at normal adolescent brain development and how that affects behavior. We want to look at strategies to, to manage adolescent behavior that may feel like temporary insanity. And we want to give you a takeaway of 10 tips for dealing with some of these adolescent behaviors. So to provide context, let's talk about normal and abnormal adolescents. Societal views say that an adolescent is normal if they are problem-free, and they are abnormal if they have or cause problems. Society tells us that they may be defective psychologically, emotionally, behaviorally, intellectually, or possibly a product of defective parents. What we know is that problems during adolescence are typical and at times can seem so off the wall and intense or disruptive, they could be considered temporary insanity. We like for our webinars to be interactive, and we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to speak. So what are some problem behaviors you have experienced with your adolescent students? What we would like for you to do is go ahead and type those answers in the chat box, and we'd like to hear from you. Awesome. I see bullying. I see refusal to work. I see anxiety. I see some depression. Absolutely. These are definitely behaviors that adolescents experience during this time in their life, and it's important to understand that some of these things are part of their normal adolescent brain development. So let's move on to that. Staying with the theme that behavior from adolescents is normal, 
Let's start to look at why. Part of this has to do, again, with their brain development. There are several forms of temporary insanity that adolescents often experience, and we'll discuss some of those today. But it's important to know that adolescent brains are fraught with problems. I mean, developmentally, they have some problems going on there. But this is normal development and should, in most cases, not be considered abnormal. To provide a little bit more context, let's look at several examples of temporary insanity that we have faced, even the adults listening in, that are could be considered socially acceptable. Uh, the first one is sports insanity. Sports insanity often plagues both males and females alike. So think about any Saturday or Sunday in this country if you're a football or soccer fan, or any day during the week if you're a baseball or NBA fan. So you're watching a game, football, basketball, soccer, whatever, and the ref makes a bad call against your favorite team. What are some of your irrational responses? Some people yell, they yell at the TV, they name call, they throw things, they kick their dogs. This is very temporary loss of self-control, and we turn potentially insane for a brief period of time. This happens often, for, for the most part, socially acceptable within reason in our society. The next acceptable form of temporary insanity is romantic love. Think back um, the first time you met your boyfriend, girlfriend, future wife. During that time, nothing else in the world mattered. They were on your mind 24-7. You could think of nothing else, and the only thing you wanted to do was please them. Now, love absolutely continues, but the intensity of that love definitely fades over time. So the insanity and the chemical reactions that you experience over time, that love changes, and we're able to function a little bit better and be better multitaskers. Now, even worse is adolescent love. During this time, they feel so strongly about a person, their life revolves around them. Grades slip, attitudes increase, the world may possibly end if there's a breakup. All of these are examples of temporary insanity that we've seen or know someone that may be afflicted from time to time, but again, perfectly normal. Another form of temporary insanity is pop culture infatuation. This is another strange phenomenon that seems to affect many on a daily basis. Think about what you would do if you met your favorite band or celebrity. Millions of people watch reality TV, its own form of insanity. They follow, they vote, they immerse themselves for a specific time, and then the insanity is over. But again, part of temporary. So we as adults often suffer from temporary forms of insanity like sports, romantic love, pop culture, and others. Thinking about that, what are other types of insanity that are considered normal and temporary. Go ahead and type those in your chat box. We want to hear from you to see what you have in mind that can be considered insanity. I see coffee. Absolutely coffee. I need coffee in the morning. Absolutely. And where it comes from can be insane. Teens' perspective on things or even adults' perspective on things. Absolutely. Like politics or religion. Driving, road rage, absolutely. Somebody cuts you off and immediately you turn a little bit crazy. Caffeine, coffee, soccer, chocolate, absolutely chocolate. These are great, absolutely. So, you know, even we as adults suffer from these temporary forms of insanity. Again, I mean, we use the word insanity in, in quotes, but it, it, it can seem like sometimes we're a little bit out there. So teens also suffer from many forms of temporary insanity, and much of the resulting behavior has to do with the brain development and kind of what's going on during that time in their life. So I am by no means a neuroscientist, but we need to have a little understanding about brain development to understand teen behavior. During adolescence, teens have many parts of the brain that are fully developed and very active needing constant stimulus or it causes them to be in a state of total boredom. So let us review some common sections you've likely encountered. 
First, there's a really big section called embarrassed by parent section. There is the sensory motor area, which they're learning how to walk and talk, and at times it shuts itself off. There is the ability to remember lyrics to offensive hip-hop songs, and they're really good at that. There's the I have no idea what's going on in my world section. There is the cars, 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 oh yeah, girls, boys section. There's the schoolwork section, and what we know is this is the smallest section of the brain. There's the ability to listen to extremely loud bass track section. There's the girls are suddenly fascinating section. And then there's the prefrontal cortex, which is not fully developed in teens. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the prefrontal cortex as we go along. The prefrontal cortex is the manager, CEO, governing body of the brain. It governs the limbic system. And the limbic system is the emotional center, and it helps the limbic system choose rational decisions. Your choice to attend this webinar is a pre-final decision. It's rational, it's not emotional. You decided you wanted to sit in here to get some information. The limbic system, again, is fully developed in teens and adults, but the prefrontal cortex is not. The limbic system is the center of the brain that controls impulses and emotions, feelings, both good and bad, and it needs constant stimulation during adolescence, and they find many ways to stimulate this. In addition, the limbic system is responsible for fight or flight, and they have a highly developed threat detection. In evolutionary terms, this is part of the threat to survival. So think about cavemen running away from dinosaurs. However, in teens, this threat to survival and this perception of threat are different. Oftentimes, it's a threat to their identity. Teens' identity are fragile, they're over-responsive, and irrational because the threat detection system is highly developed. I had a student in class one time that was um, texting one of his friends across the way. And they were going back and forth, completely off task. And remember, when you were in high school, the teacher would say, okay, show me the note. In this case, I walked over and I wanted to see the texts that were going on because I assumed it was inappropriate or not okay. And of course, it wasn't okay at class time. So when I walked over, I'm sure you remember stories of whenever you were in class and one of your friends ate the note. Well, in this case, the student decided to break their phone in half so that I couldn't see the note. Again, this was a completely irrational decision, but it was a threat to their identity, and they were afraid they were going to be embarrassed in front of their friends, so they overreacted. In addition, the limbic system is responsible for teens being head over heels in love. And again, we talked about that a little bit earlier. They abandon everything, and it's all about now. I also had a friend in high school that his girlfriend moved away to Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'll always remember this. One day, his girlfriend moves away. The next day, my friend tells me that he's going to find any way to get himself to Las Cruces, New Mexico. He decides that it would be a brilliant idea to go buy a bus ticket and start his way to get there. But he didn't tell anybody else but me. I ended up having to tell his parents. After a statewide hunt, they finally found this kid on the front steps of this girl's house and brought him back home. But again, a completely irrational decision. However, during this time in their lives, they're mostly controlled by that highly developed limbic system. So again, the cause of most of their issues is that that limbic system that's fully developed, it's like it is in adults, but the part that governs it, again, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. There's a disconnect that teens are, and makes teens naturally unreliable, and biologically, they're really set up to fail. And I think we, we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about adolescence and behavior. So let's talk a little bit about the prefrontal cortex. In teens, the prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped. Uh, we talked about it a minute ago. Remember that it's the CEO of the company or the organization. Now, this CEO often takes frequent breaks, vacations, 
unscheduled most of the time, and teens don't know when the prefrontal cortex is going to decide to take a vacation. But when that prefrontal cortex does take a vacation, teens are only governed by emotion. So what feels good and right at the time, and it's not often, often that is not school or your classroom. So you may see things like not getting their homework done, texting in class, talking to friends, or maybe just even asleep in your class because what's going on right now is not very stimulating to their limbic system. However, there may be weeks or even months on end where the prefrontal cortex is on the job. The teens making good decisions and they may fool us into thinking the CEO is fully developed and ready to go, which can result in thinking students are more responsible and mature and are able to consistently act that way. But we have to remember at this stage in an adolescent's life, the CEO can take an unexpected trip at any time. So this is often the story you hear about parents finally leaving the student alone, why they go on vacation for the first time without them because they've been so responsible. However, it's about this time the CEO decides to take a vacation, right about the time the parents drive out of the driveway. The student is now controlled by the limbic system and it calls all of its other limbic system friends they know, and the parents come home to Animal House. This is a story we hear all the time. But again, this is normal development in, the, in, in adolescence. That CEO takes vacation. So what this brain development boils down to is that adolescents are often plagued with temporary insanity. And that's the only real way to describe some of the behaviors that they're doing. I'm not saying the behavior is not wrong or unacceptable, but that for the most part is normal part of the adolescent development. Now, Dr. Pat Fryman, one of the psychologists here at Boys Town and our vice president of outpatient behavioral health, um, came up with several different diagnoses to describe these temporary adolescent insanity. Um, we're going to talk about six of them. And many of these you can diagnose on your own. So we're going to start with the first one. The first one is can be described as rationality and abstention disorder, or RAD. RAD is characterized by the absence of rational thinking. And you can diagnose it by asking two questions after a teen does a behavior that is completely irrational. The first question, Why'd you do that? If the teen answers something like, I felt like it, or I don't know, the next question is, what were you thinking? If the teen answers something like, I don't know, then you have successfully diagnosed rationality and abstention disorder. I have suffered from rationality and abstention disorder, and I think several of you out there probably have too. Uh, I remember back in a time when I was in high school and I was in a stats class. My stats teacher was so boring. He would read from the book with his head down and just talk on and for the entire 50-minute class. Now, I grew up in Oklahoma, and during the springs, we usually left the uh, windows open. So one day, as he was droning on and on and on, I sat in the back of the room, and there was a window open. Now, I was suffering from a little bit of rad and decided it would be a great idea to climb out the window, go around the front of the school, come back to the classroom door, knock on the door, and when the teacher answered, I said, sorry, I was late. The teacher looked at me like I was completely insane and said, why did you do that? I didn't know I walked out the window, but I actually did. And what were you thinking? And, of course, the principal asked me the same questions. If they, were, if they knew I was suffering from rad, they would have been able to handle that situation a little bit better. So remember the limbic system. While RAD is an emotional behavior, as adults, when faced with RAD, or students that have RAD, we want a rational answer because we need a response. But teens do not think like that. Their limbic system took over and they were on an emotional high. An adult brain doesn't function the same way and we don't understand how they don't have a rational answer. By asking for a rational answer, we're programming the student in that case to lie because we need a response. 
and then we punish them for lying, which doesn't make sense to them, and it doesn't really make sense to us. So the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, has a second function. If they make a decision that's completely irrational, and we as adults continue to ask the same question over and over, why did you do that? They typically come up with a response, which is a lie. Now, whenever we catch them in the lie, the prefrontal cortex decides to take over again, and it does its second duty, that of their personal brain attorney. The attorney-client privilege between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system work really well together to try to get themselves out of trouble, and that's the main function of what's going on. Oftentimes, we are active participants in increasing the instances of RAD and causing kids to lie because, in reality, they don't know why they did that because it felt good at that time. Another type of disorder that often plagues our young adolescents is situational mutism. Situational mutism is basically when teens forget how to talk, but only really to adults. Kids just won't talk to us. We only get a, yep, uh-huh, something like that. So if we ask the question of, please start your chores, or how was your day, we might get a K, or good, or all right. However, if one of their friends calls on the phone, they could talk to them for hours, and we wonder what, from ourselves, why can't they have that kind of, kind of conversation with us? What we have to understand is when we want to have a conversation with teens, we often try to have these conversations and fail to recognize the importance of the task they are currently engaged in, which could be video games, texting, watching TV, talking to their friends. We forget the world revolves around them. So when we want to ask questions about chores, homework, grades, tardiness, their attitude, getting a job or applying for college, this is completely boring to them. So they will suffer from situational mutism. Now to combat this, we need to make sure that we have the teens full attention and set our expectations on how they will respond, essentially teaching the social skill of having a conversation to hold them to this expectation. Another common adolescent temporary disorder is sensory interruptus. Now sensory interruptus is a phenomenon where teens cannot see or hear because they're focused only on one thing, themselves. They can't see past the piece of paper they just threw away that missed the garbage can, the book that is potentially right next to them on the floor, or even the bell ringer instructions that are written on the board. Instead, all they see is their friend they need to talk to or catch up with, the text they just got, or the conversation they're currently having. For teens, honestly, anything an adult says in a normal voice tone cannot be heard. They cannot see or hear the first instruction or task that an adult gives. And oftentimes, we condition them to learn that the first time we say something, it's really meaningless without a consequence. As adults, we increase the likelihood of this disorder by telling them again, raising their voice, or not issuing a consequence. Like, for instance, the teacher that was in this slide here. She asked them to get their science book out, kids didn't respond, asked them to get it out again, they didn't respond, and of course she had to raise her voice, and finally they responded, because we've conditioned them to answer at that point in time. Another problem that uh, teens face is woe is mania. <laughs> woe is mania is a condition of chronic boredom and also their life is so hard syndrome. Teens are chronically bored and we don't engage them with normal activities. However, during adolescence, they need to be special. They were when they were babies, but they aren't as special now. So if you have children, um, think back whenever that baby was born. At times you would just walk into the room, look in their crib and think, oh, you're so special or when your child first learned to walk, or your toddler sang their first song. But if you have teens, you walk in the house, they're on the couch, they have chips all over them, and they're looking at the TV, drooling, not as special as they used to be. Additionally, teens need to be independent. So they have a problem figuring out independence versus dependence. 
They think they can go out into the world, they have all the answers, they can do anything they want because they have a credit card now and a cell phone. However, they do need you. They need you for a ride to the mall, food, money. For teens, they don't want you, but they need you. And oftentimes this is a problem for them because they feel uh, less independent. And oftentimes we don't get gratitude or appreciation because they see themselves as independent. But you reminding them that we need them often makes this worse. And then out of nowhere comes puberty. And this is nature's way of programming them to be a sufficient mate. But in no way at this point in time during their lives are they ready to do that. Economically, emotionally, psychologically, the only way they are prepared is physically. They need to be liked by the opposite of sex. They need to look their best. However, there is no time in their life where they'll look their worst. You can think of ac acne as um, nature's way of keeping them apart. For boys and sometimes girls, they have no way of, uh, or they have no idea how to talk to the opposite sex. But for gentlemen, if they could, girls would teach them great things like hygiene. So think about your middle school and high school boys they often are pretty stinky. And to combat this, they often just go to their dad's stuff or the medicine cabinet or the local Walgreens and get as much Axe body spray or whatever they can and spray it all over them. So this is a problem. However, they do eventually learn to talk to girls, but in this case, their voice often fails them. So think about a boy that's pretty suave having a conversation with a girl and then all of a sudden his voice cracks and then there's laughing and woe is me uh, takes over. At times you will see teens turning into temporary Eeyores, moping around like the world and you are out to get them. Life is terrible. But that's all part of the brain development that's going on. Next we're going to talk about truth relativitis. Now truth relativitis involves the double standard of rules for teens. Thinking about teens, if I break an adult's rule, it's really not that big of a deal. They'll forgive me, life goes on, and your rules aren't that important. But if I break a friend's rule, it's a huge deal. Life is over, things are going to go bad. In addition, lying to an adult. Same difference, who cares? It's not that big of a deal in my brain. But if I lie to a friend, it's a nearly unforgivable sin. So we have to understand that there's a double standard when it comes to teen development. The last thing we're going to talk about is pharmacitis. Now, adults often wonder why teens experiment with drugs, and we call this form of insanity pharmacitis. For teens, drugs often work for them. I mean, I'm not talking about drug abuse, but I'm talking about experimentation and um, you know, going out and parties. Drugs often work for them to help them feel better. They help uncool kids become cool. They help establish friendships. They expedite identity development because I'm an adult now and they can't stop me. It reflects a little bit of rebellion. They get a little bit of a rush from potentially getting in trouble. In addition, during this, it spotlights some of the adult hypocrisy that they see. They see maybe their mom and dad uh, having a dinner party and they're having drinks. So if the adults are doing it, and again, I'm smarter than they are, why can't I do it? And also, we talk to them often about maybe utilizing marijuana. And then they decide to get smart and look some things up and they find out how much more dangerous alcohol is and how many more accidents it causes. And again, that that provides a lot more of a, the adult hypocrisy in their mind. We become the hypocrites. So to review, we talked about six common types of temporary adolescent insanity. Rationality and abstention is when they lose all sense of rational thought. Situational mutism is when they forget how to talk to adults. Sensory interruptus, they are so self-consumed by, them, by themselves that they forget about everything else around them. Woe is menia, where life is awful and nobody understands me. Truth relativitis is where we have a double standard on truth and rules. And pharmacitis is the experimentation of drugs and alcohol. 
So which type, and again, we want to talk to you guys because we've been talking for a little bit, which type of temporary adolescent insanity do you think is the toughest to deal with of the six types? Rationality and absentia, situational mutism, sensory interruptus, woesmenia, truth relativitis, and pharmacitis. Go ahead and type those in your chat. I see a lot of folks uh, clicking on rad, absolutely. Uh, woe is mania. Pharmacitis is absolutely something difficult to deal with because we don't want our, our teens or um, the kids that we are teaching using drugs and alcohol. But for a, like for me, uh, RAD is so difficult because why did you do that or what were you thinking um, is a definite adult response because we think through our decisions before we make them. Whenever we think about a teen, they're not thinking through those things. They are focusing solely on emotion and what feels good at the time. So they often make mistakes. So thank you for adding those in. Now let's talk a little bit about some contributing factors that increase the instances of some of these adolescent behaviors. And one of those contributing factors is we as adults. Now, how we increase the instances of these can be, first of all, boiled down to how we give criticism to teens. And this can increase um, RAD, it can increase situational mutism, it at times can increase pharmacitis. When we give criticism to other adults in our lives or our professional lives, it's often in private and not in front of other peers. However, with teens, especially in the classroom, we have no trouble giving feedback in front of other teens. This often sets us up for failure because remember, teens need to be important, social pressures are real, and also their status is one of those um, fight or flight responses. It's important to make sure that whenever you're giving criticism to make that conversation as private as possible. I was recently at a school and I was uh, doing some observations in class and I saw an interaction with a, a student and um, a teacher. The student, of course, was talking to one of his friends while the teacher was um, teaching class. The teacher goes over and corrects the student, which absolutely she should have. However, she did it in front of everybody else. Um, she said that you need to stop talking. Of course, he started talking again. She corrected him again. And uh, she needed to correct him a third time. In this case, she said, you need to stop talking or go to the office. Well, of course, what do you think the kid shows? Because they needed to save face and they may have been suffering from one of these temporary insanities and the way we gave criticism increased the likelihood of that power struggle. The student decided to walk out, and as he was walking out of class, he was getting high fives from all of his friends. Students with social anxiety will do almost anything to get out of the situation, even if the alternative causes them harm. So if you have to give criticism, make the conversation private or as private as possible to reduce the possibility of that negative reaction. In addition, be mindful of your ratio of positive and negative interactions. Research and, and recent research would suggest that the strongest marriages have a ratio of five positive or affirmative or affirmations to negative criticisms. And these are almost uh, immune to divorce. The research shows that divorce relationships, that ratio is more one to one. In the classroom, if we don't want our teens to divorce us, then we need to be very purposeful about what we're saying to them, how we're saying it, and also the reinforcement that we're giving to them. Another thing that causes um, some of these increases in behavior is that adults often turn into Weisenheimers. We often continue to ask teens questions over and over and over, expecting that rational response. And remember, teens often truly don't know the answer because their answer of I felt so or felt like it is not acceptable to us and we force them to lie. So questions like, why can't you get up on time? Why don't you do your homework? Why did you roll your eyes when I greeted you this morning? Sometimes they just don't know the answer. Sometimes they do. But if you continue to ask over and over and over again, expect a lie. 
So to finish this out, let's talk about 10 tips for dealing with some of this um, temporary insanity. Tip number one, think about the last time you were pulled over. I know some of you out there have never been pulled over, but some of us have. Whenever the police officer came up to the car, they were completely calm. You knew you were in trouble. They didn't yell. They were completely polite. They asked you for your license and registration. They went back to their car. They came back. They gave you your ticket. After you got your ticket, most adult behavior will often signal before you get back on the road. And think about that. When is any other time would you signal to get back on the road? And you probably go the speed limit at least for the rest of that day and possibly for the rest of that week. Now, the reaction from the police officer was very neutral. And we want, we want you to be that way also. We want you to stick to the facts. We want you to avoid shouting or raising your voice. We want you to listen even as they shout or if they're raising their voice. Always stay calm and keep your voice low. What you'll find is that you will get better outcomes from teens if you are that neutral party. Next. We want you to aim for caution, but not total prevention or elimination, because again, students are going to test limits, they're going to experiment, but we want them to aim for caution. I recently talked to um, uh, a teacher that she had a great story about a, a group of parents in her school. The parents had this, her teen and also their peer group completely convinced that they had a private investigator watching them at all times. The way they accomplished this was that during every conversation like driving home, they listened and they showed interest in that conversation, but they didn't invade their space. Oftentimes, adolescents don't think we're listening. In addition, they communicated with other parents and other teachers. They looked at their social media sites. They tracked some of their texts. And what ended up happening is whenever they would have a party or get together, one of the parents of the group would show up and completely blow the teen's mind. They absolutely thought that all their parents had hired a private investigator to watch their every move to the point where the teens actually thought they knew what the person looked like and they were on the lookout for them all the time. Now what this causes is a little bit of caution. We want our teens to be careful in their lives because again, we have to understand that they're making emotional decisions a lot of the times. While they're making those emotional decisions, we want them to be careful and cautious. Next, allow for a little pain and suffering. And again, I'm not talking about beating your children, but consequences in life are important. Allow for time between behavior and consequence. In the classroom, we want you to make sure you use the smallest consequence possible to change behavior. But again, let them know behavior has an outcome. Because behavior is learned through repetition and contrast, either through a positive behavior or a negative behavior. And we have to let our kids know that making mistakes are okay, but there will absolutely be consequences to those mistakes. If it didn't hurt to fall down, we would never have learned to walk. And this is true for teens and students and anybody. We have to learn that there are consequences to our behavior so that we, may, we uh, learn better. Next, we want you to think about negotiating, not bribing, for positive behavior. In the classroom, teens have things that we want. We want them to complete their homework. We want them to show up on time. We want them to stay on task. They also have stuff that we want. They may not say it, but they like reinforcement. They like positive consequences. They like privileges. They like access to other peers. You can make this a partnership. They have things that you want. You have things that they want. It's not bribery. It's negotiating. And you can get a lot more positive behavior if you keep that in mind. Next tip, adolescents need boundaries. So children need fences to feel secure, but they'll also, they also need fences to know where they can, what they can rebel against. So in saying that, in your classroom, you need to set expectations for what behavior is. You want to model low tolerances whenever they are up against that fence or dancing on the fence or jump over the fence, because they absolutely will. 
and be consistent with the implementation of your reinforcement and correction. If you maintain nice low tolerances and have high expectations, the students in your room or the adolescents in your life will absolutely test all those fences, but if they maintain consistency, then they will stay right around those fences rather than mowing them over and looking for another fence. Tip number six, we want you to make sure that you talk to your adolescents and have good conversations with them about negative influences in their life. What we know is that our peer groups have a greater influence on our behavior than we have on an entire peer group. So we want to have conversations that a peer can negatively influence their you know, behavior, but also their personality and also their status. We want to make sure that we have really good conversations about negative influences in their life. However, don't judge the friends that they have because, again, that will push them farther towards those friends. Number seven is one that maybe doesn't need to be said but absolutely should be said. Uh, never get physical. We understand there are folks out there listening that maybe are in uh, alternative schools or specialized environments and you're highly trained on um, how to do physical restraints. But if at all possible, if things get physical with a, um, a teen or an adolescent um, or really any student, we need to make sure that we use the police or a resource officer so that we can ensure the safety of everyone. It lessens the likelihood that you'll lose your influence and also you're more likely to harm the relationship if you get physical with a student. So you wanna make sure that you use the appropriate contrast which would be a police or resource officer unless of course you're in an environment like an alternative environment that would require you to do that more often. Next, try not to respond to threats. Children will often use their, their ace or their highest card to get an emotional response from adults. Comments like, I hate you, you're a horrible teacher, I got a bad grade because you hate me, I'm just gonna drop out. What uh, adolescents are doing in this situation is trying to get you in an emotional response because they're living emotionally at the time. They're not making prefrontal decisions they're making limbic decisions. And if you respond to those threats or those harsh words or those traps and emotional, then you'll get wrapped up in a power struggle. And we want you to avoid that. Remain calm and respond with uh, just a normal voice tone and issue consequences for behavior. Number nine, make sure you honor their identity. Remember during adolescence, they're going through changes and deciding who they are going to be as an adult. Make sure that you listen to their opinions Try not to be judgmental about the choices they're making. Allow them to share their ideas and give them opportunities to try new things in life. I remember the first time one of my students walked in and they had a nose ring in. That was an interesting choice, but again, I had to make sure that I wasn't judgmental about the situation because they were trying new things out. What ended up happening over time, because uh, I talked to her later and she didn't get the reaction that she wanted, that she was expecting, she ended up taking the nose ring out. It was like a big hoop, like a, like a bull ring, not like a little nose ring. But again, teens are testing to see where we're at. Um, if we are judgmental about some of their choices, um, it will be more likely to push them to hard. And our next, our next tip is the one that you always have to keep in mind. Behavior change takes time, and you have to remember the rule of time. Nothing lasts forever. We, if we are consistent, we are patient, and we offer support and give appropriate space and reinforce, reinforce, reinforce the positive behaviors that we see, our adolescents are more likely to come back to baseline at some point in time. Because again, they're going to push, they're going to see what adults' reactions are, and they're living very emotionally. So remember that rule of time. It's important. And finally, back to the brain. Don't forget that an adolescent brain is not finished growing. They are highly emotional beings and they crave that activity. They may at one second be in a huge argument, fight, screaming match, or completely non-compliant and disruptive to your class, and the next minute ask what time lunch is or what is my assignment today complete change or 180 from where they were at before. Because again, that prefrontal cortex decided to take, take a break for a minute and then it came right back. So they do things for that emotional high. 
Now, much of this uh, webinar is based on Dr. Pat Fryman's uh, work with adolescents. So there are several uh, resources we have available if you want more information about adolescents. Um, one is a DVD on adolescents and other temporary mental health disorders. The next is Good Night, Sweet Dreams, I Love You. Now get to bed and sleep. This is talking a little bit about toddlers. And a really good book, Raising Children Without Losing Your Voice or Your Mind. So I've been talking a little bit. Do you have any questions for me? Go ahead and type those in your chat box, and we'll see if we can uh, answer some of them. We have a few more minutes here. So one of the questions is suggestions for motivating young adults. When you think about adolescents, their strongest motivation is typically social groups and peers rather than adults. So if you can offer them time with their peers and like free time to chat and discuss more group activities, that kind of thing, that is often more motivating to them than stuff. Also, privileges and freedom. Um, if they can get a sense of that independence, oftentimes that is uh, motivating within reason. Great question. How can we tie this in with restorative discipline? That's a great question. So here is what I want to talk a little bit about that. With restorative discipline, you often get together and um, talk about consequences or choices. And I think that's important. With restorative discipline, I think it's important to have a conversation uh, with your teens that may be involved in that on what's going on with brain development. I mean, you can absolutely have a conversation about that. And just having a little bit of context for them um, can sometimes help them uh, understand behavior a little bit better. But we are about at the end of our time. And here at Boys Town, we really want to help you to achieve any of your educational or um, school or district goals. If you're interested in any of our trainings or even a customized plan to meet your school's potential, um, John McGuire is one of our sales staff, and he would be happy to talk to you about anything that we have to offer. You can also email any questions that you might have to training at boystown.org, and also any questions that you might have as far as behavior or training, you can email askthetrainer at boystown.org. Please also follow us on Twitter. Our handle is bt underscore ed. We tweet out helpful resources, webinars, information every day, multiple times a day. And also our website, boystowntraining.org, has many helpful resources. In our resources section, we have uh, lesson plans. We have blogs that are helpful. We have ask the trainer questions and um, links to all of our social media. So we really appreciate you listening in on our webinar today, and we hope to hear from you again. Thank you so much. Take care.